Will you pray with me? God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your glorious grace, you have made us your children through Jesus Christ, who has bought us and ransomed us from the world and given us an eternal adoption as your children in your church. We pray that you would hold this whole family of faith together until we see you again face to face. By your Holy Spirit, strengthen us for the days that are ahead and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. His name is Saul or Paul, depending. A lot of people think that uh, St. Paul um, received his name Paul after he um, converted to Christianity, that he was Saul in his past life and he was Paul in his new life. And the reason why uh, people believe this is because, you know, we have some precedent in the Bible for this kind of thing. You know, Abram went to Abraham, right? And Sarai went to Sarah, right? And Jacob went to who? Does anybody know? Israel, right. So, I mean, we, we have some precedent for this, but in this case, um, Paul and Saul, it was not a pre-conversion, post-conversion kind of thing. Did you guys know that? No. But back in Jesus' day, in the first century, in Judea, the Holy Land, in Levant, or whatever you're going to call it, uh, people typically had two names. They had their ethnic name, and they had the name that they were known in public. Because in public, people spoke Greek. Greek was kind of like the, the English of its day. It was ubiquitous. It was everywhere, right? And so you often had uh, an ethnic name, and then you had a name by which you would go on, on in like public life. And so that's why his name was Saul, which is a very ethnically Hebrew kind of name. And his name was also Paul, which was his Greek name. So it's, the meaning of his name is not because of his conversion, but the meaning of his name does also tell us something about his family life. Did you know that Saul or Paul or whatever you're going to call him at the moment, that he was both a Hebrew and he was also a Roman citizen? He was a guy who lived between two worlds that were at odds with each other. He was a guy whose own story, his own family story, must have been pretty interesting because of the Hebrew and the Roman side. Kind of interesting. His name tells us a lot about his family. Do you know my name is Robert Paul Sundquist? Yeah. But it's also Anthony Robert Barba Jr., depending. Yeah, I have a birth name. My birth name is Anthony Robert Barba Jr., which is a good Italian name. It means beard, so I come by it honestly, right? But when I was adopted by my stepdad, he gave us all good Norwegian names, like Robert Paul Sundquist. So I hate to break it to you, Pastor Craig, I'm not Norwegian. He's going to convert me. That's hilarious. I converted. That's hilarious, man. And so depending on who you're talking to in my family, I'm either Tony or Tony Jr. or I'm Bob. But, you know, for me, the most important identity that I have is not whether I'm Bob or Tony or Jr. or whatever. My most important identity comes from the fact that I belong to the family of God. That's where I get my identity. In baptism, God has put his name on me and you and made us heirs, heirs of heaven through what he did in the waters of baptism. St. Paul today is going to be using some uh, familial kind of language in Ephesus um, to talk to those Christians who are gathered there. I want to show you, Tim Jones, everybody else can watch with us, but I want to show you uh, some of this familial language. If you brought your Bible today, now's the time, all right? You can open it up to Ephesians chapter 1. Some of you have caught on, though, and you know that I will share my Bible with you. So, But don't, don't, you know, you can't mark in this one. You can mark in your own. So bring your own, but just in case you forgot today, I will be generous. Can everybody see that? All right, this is Ephesians chapter 1. I want to show you some of that familial kind of language that he's using. 
Notice in verse 2, he says, God, our Father. He doesn't say, God, my Father, or God, your Father, singular. He says, in a collective kind of way, God is our Father. That's familial kind of language. And then in verse 4, it says that he chose us in him. Hang on one second. Chose us for what? He chose us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ. He says that you have God as your father and he chose you for an adoption in him through Jesus Christ. And then look, it goes on to say in verse 11 that in him we have obtained a what? Inheritance. That is all familial kind of language that he's using there. And this is actually really important because Paul has a really deep conviction and a really strong love for the church in Ephesus. And it's because he feels like he's family with them. Let me tell you a little bit about the story of Paul in Ephesus. And in case you want to like Snopes me or check it out, or if you, hopefully you're going to want to go back and read this because I'm about to tell you some stuff that's pretty wild all right? It's Acts chapter 19 and 20, all right? Acts 19 and 20. But here's what happened. Paul wasn't even aiming at Ephesus. He wasn't even on planning on going there, but he just like happened to stop by there. And when he did, he, he turned a couple of weeks into three years. Yeah, fish and visitors, right? After three days. Yeah, so he was there for just over three years. Talk about a long time. And when he started his work there, everything was just going great. You know, he shared the gospel. People started believing. This community of believers started to gather around. They were excited about God's word. But things started to get a little rough. He got kicked out of the synagogue that he was preaching in, and he had to go preach in public. And when he was preaching in public, it was so wildly successful. The gospel was changing so many people's lives that people actually started giving up their former way of life. You see, in Ephesus, there's every year there's this huge uh, festival. You can Google this, but it's really awkward, so, you know, whatever. Um, What they would do is they would take these silver statues of Artemis, and they would process them every year down the streets of the city, right? So everybody was in on this racket, right? You would buy these silver statues of Artemis. You'd participate because it was the cool thing to do. But when Paul started preaching the gospel and people started to become Christians, they were throwing their idols away. And dude, it got so big and so much of a problem that one of the guys who made these statues, his name is Demetrius. Don't worry, there's not a quiz. This guy is named Demetrius. He was so upset because they literally shut down his business. He couldn't sell a silver statue to save his life. And so Demetrius got so mad about what was going on that they had shut down his religious business that he gets all the people together and Paul starts a riot in the city of Ephesus. Dude, wouldn't that be nuts to start a riot in the city? I think the only thing that would be crazier than starting that riot is after having started the riot, you leave. And that's exactly what St. Paul did. After he starts this riot and and things are are big and explosive, he just leaves. It's like leaving the dinner table without doing the dishes. Can I get an amen to that? He went over to Macedonia where they were cutting wood, you know, hanging out with the loggers and all that kind of stuff. But before he left, he, he encouraged the Christians that were there. He said, just stick to it. Stick to it. And don't be discouraged if they're persecuting you. Because listen, they persecuted Jesus too. So you stay faithful. That was a little easier to be said than to be done. Because when he came back from Macedonia on his way through Ephesus, on his way to Jerusalem, he wasn't even going to stay then. They were discouraged. They were just so discouraged. And so he got them together and he He encouraged them. He said, listen, do not lose the faith. Hold true to Christ. Believe in what he has done for you and be strong. Be strong in the faith. And after he had encouraged them, he gave them this warning. This is from Ephesians chapter 20, beginning in verse 29. He said this, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock. And from amongst your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, be alert, he says. 
remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He's encouraging them, but he's also warning them that the persecution will not cease and to remain faithful and to stay the course. And so he goes to Jerusalem, and after Jerusalem, he writes this letter to the Ephesians in chapter 1, where we are today, where he says things like they are blessed, that they are chosen by God, that they're adopted by his grace. And that's all well and good that he's saying those things, but this congregation is having a really hard time believing him because they literally were suffering the persecution that he had warned them about. They were being persecuted still from Demetrius. Dude wouldn't let it go. And they were also suffering persecution inside of the church. There were people that were being divisive, that were saying, hey, you're a Christian, but if you want to be an uber Christian, not one who drives in a car, but like a super Christian, if you want to be a super Christian, then you got to do this, that, and the other thing, and it ripped the church apart. How many of you know it's awful when churches fight? awful. And so persecutions without and persecutions within. And instead of feeling loved, instead of feeling chosen by God, instead of feeling like they were a part of his family, they felt fated. Fated to be the people who always have to get the short end of the stick. They felt rejected. They felt like a failure. They felt shameful and even guilty because They couldn't even hold it together. When things got tough, it was hard to just hold it together. Now, if you're here today, and if you're one of those who can really resonate with how the church in Ephesus was feeling, if you feel like the fight is getting tough out there in the world, and you can feel the pressure from the world to try and compromise your faith, or if you're one of those who's here today, and you have fighting inside of your family life, and you're just struggling, and you feel faded, like you're always going to have a tough life, and it's just never going to get easier. If you feel guilt, if you feel shame, if you feel rejected, St. Paul has surprising news for your heart and soul to receive today. He says this, Despite how you feel, you are chosen. You are blessed. Despite how you feel, you have been adopted and you have received this, not because of anything you did or failed to do, but it's all yours by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ and his blood alone. You, friends, have been brought together with these Ephesian Christians into a community, which is more like a family family with a bond that's stronger than nationality or ethnicity or even a preferred style of religion. You have been made a part of this family through the bond of blood, the blood of Jesus Christ for you. That blood of Jesus Christ which brings you into the family through the waters of baptism. That blood of Jesus Christ which he welcomes you to receive at his very own table. That blood of Jesus Christ which guarantees you an inheritance which is eternal and kept for you strong in the Holy Spirit. So when you face trouble, when you face trouble, and how many of you know that you're going to face trouble in this world? Anybody? Whether you face it personally, or whether you face it in your family, or whether you face it in your community, or at work, or in the world, no matter the circumstances, you have assurance that God has got you forever. Listen to how St. Paul says it in Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10. It's highlighted in blue here. Let's actually, can you guys read that? Let's read it together. Ready? Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. A couple of years ago, I came across this story 
from a guy named Carl Connor. And he talks about this uh, time when there was this freak storm, a freak snowstorm. How many of you remember the freak snowstorm last year? I don't know. I, I would like to hit repeat. Anybody else? No. Sarah Harper says no. All right. All right. None of that. But he talks about this freak snowstorm that hit North Carolina where they got like six feet of snow, but not like happy snow, right? This was wet, heavy snow. And he was driving down I-40 and he noticed this phenomenon. In, um, in North Carolina along I-40, they planted these groves of, of large, tall, young pine trees. And what happened is when the heavy snow went on them, the branches began to, to bow and they began to bend from the weight. And what they did is they, they would lean against the trunk of the tree next to them. And they would lean against the branches of the tree next to them. And because of the weight of everything, they all began to lean together. And when they did that, they were saved. But he also noticed that not every tree was in a grove. There were some that were isolated and, and by themselves. And when the, the heavy, wet snow went on them, there was nothing to lean on. So they simply snapped and broke and fell in the cold, wet snow and died. St. Paul says the church in Ephesus is to lean on each other. When life gets difficult, when it gets too hard, you have this church, this community, this faith that you can lean on. When things get difficult in your life as well, you can do the same thing. He has made us for each, each other. I guess what I'm trying to say is that's the community in faith, community, Lutheran church and schools. You get that? That's the community in faith, community, Lutheran church and schools. It means that we're more like, like a family. That's what we're more like. We're not like church incorporated or like big box church or anything like that. No, we're not anything like that. We're a family. And I know that getting into this new building was going to be challenging, but, but I guess what I'm really glad to say is that even though getting into the new building was going to be challenging, the thing that we haven't lost is what makes this gathered group of Christians so special. We're family. Now, it'd be easy coming into this new place to kind of have this mentality of like the old guard mentality saying that, well, We've been here the longest, so we have say when it's us versus you, if that scenario were to ever happen, but, and, and by the way, that scenario is not happening, but if that were to ever happen, the first two chapters of Ephesians would be very instructive for us in that moment. Because what it says is this, whether you've been here since the beginning, how many of you were here since the beginning? It's a couple meeting in the library, right? Whether you've been here since the beginning or this place is flush with new faces, Christ remains the head over all things in the church. This body, this community, this family of faith serves its purpose only as it expresses itself in the fullness of Him who fills all and all in this ministry. So it's never about our one ministry or, or our solitary contribution over all others. Instead, the Lordship of Jesus Christ ushers in a new way of being church. An age where community witness is not a solitary reward for having done something or done anything at all. And this way of being community, like a good family, is actually a witness to the world that Jesus is here. We're family. We're family brought by the word to the waters of baptism where we receive a new birth and he has placed his new name on us and made us a part of his family. I promise I had the sermon before your baptism today, right? <laughs> and he nourishes us in the Lord's Supper and we are continually encouraged as we are taught God's word and... And service to others shows them that we're more than just a name. We are part of a family. 
where we are all related by blood. Rojo, did you know that we're blood related? Pretty cool, huh? Did you know, Harley, that we're blood related? Did you know that we're blood related? Ed, we're, bre- we're blood related, aren't we? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood that brought us into a living testimony of lives that are changed because Jesus himself lives and reigns to all eternity. So Paul, in our reading today, imagines the Ephesians living as a people known not for their praise of human institutions or idols or ideas, but instead known for their joy in what Christ is doing to redeem aching souls in a suffering world. And our mission, which is inviting people to know Jesus, consistently focuses us on what God is doing in our midst and in the midst of our city and in the midst of the world itself. He shifts us, like this text, from being seeing our privilege in the world as receiving blessings, to actually being a blessing by giving away freely and undeservedly what he has so richly given us in God and Christ. In whose name we pray, amen.